good morning. We do very much appreciate you being here. First song this morning, 296. 296. Let's all sing. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We each and every one of you here this morning. We have with us this morning Brother Jace Pruitt, and he will be doing our speaking for us, and we appreciate him being with us this morning. We want to uh, welcome you here. If you're uh, visiting with us this morning, you're certainly our honored guest, and we invite you to be back at any time that you might have opportunity. We do have those that are joining us here and some that are in the parking lot. We appreciate the presence of each and every one of you. We want to continue to remember those that we have on our prayer list. I want you to look this list over, and there may be those that are not on there. If we need to make some updates, please let us know. If we have some that need to come off, we'd, we always like for that to happen as well. So if we overlook something or let us know, we'll make sure that that gets announced for you. An update on Donna. Uh, Jeannie gave me an update just a few minutes ago. She is uh, just really tired from the chemo that she's taking, so uh, please, uh, she's not able to be here this morning. Had a pretty rough night, not sleeping well, so... If you would remember her in your prayers, we'd appreciate that. She goes on the IV chemo this next week, and hopefully that'll be a little bit uh, better on her than the pills are. So please remember her in your prayers at this time. If there are others, again, let us know. We'll make sure that that gets announced. Next song, 611. 611. We'll sing verses 1 and 3 of this song. Let's all sing. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep veil. Jesus has said I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight Hallelujah. 
Psalm, before we have our scripture reading and our opening prayer, 613. Hold to God's unchanging hand. <clears throat> Amen. We'll sing verses 1 and 3 of this song. <clears throat> all right, let's all sing. Time is filled with swift transition. No. chapter 3, we'll be reading verses 12 through 15. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Let's go to God in prayer, please. Our Father God in heaven, hallowed be thy name throughout heaven and earth. Father, we truly find it a blessing, an honor, and a privilege, a true privilege to be here today in your midst. For we know that as we gather in your name, you are here with us. Thank you. Father, we thank you for your word, which we're about to have preached to us, which we've studied this morning, and which we, we turn to, good times and bad. For we know that it is the truth, and that from it we can glean much. Father, we thank you for, for those that, that dedicate their lives to, to bringing the truth to us, your word, that is. And we thank you, Father, for those that that cause this congregation to function the way it does. We pray that as we do operate here, if that's a word, and as we worship you here, that we do so in a manner that is pleasing and correct in your sight. That is our intent. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, for with him, we have the hope of heaven. Without him, we're lost. And we thank you, Father, for realizing that we are weak and need you every hour. And we pray, Father, that we will be there and do what you would have us to do each and every hour. Father, be with us now as we enter into this worship service to you, the one and only living God. For we truly want to be your children. And we pray, Father, that all is done in your son's name for in his name we pray this prayer jesus the christ amen as we prepare our minds to partake of the lord's supper we'll sing number 383 383 jesus keep me near the cross <clears throat> we'll sing verses one and three of this song Let's all sing. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mouth. 
mountain in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the sing songs about the cross. We sing songs about Jesus and the cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. But at this point now, in our worship service, we remember that he willingly went to the cross and suffered for each and every one of us, for all of mankind, all those that will turn to him and put him on. As his children, we have the command to come around his table and partake of this emblem. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, as we prepare to partake of this bread, which to us as Christians represents your son's body as it hung on the cross between heaven and earth, we pray, Father, that we put the world out of our minds, realize what we are doing, and remember the cross. And remember your son. For it is his name we pray, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Once again, let's go to God in prayer. Father, again, we gather around your table this time to partake of the fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians represents your son's shed blood on the cross for the remission of our sins. The only blood that can do that. We pray, Father, that once again, as we partake of it, we do this in a pleasing manner to your sight. It is his name we pray this prayer, Jesus the Christ. Amen. concludes the Lord's Supper, and at this time we'll just take a remembrance of what it takes to keep the building going, what it takes to keep the mission work going. We do have mission work, and also what we, do, what we need to just keep everything up and running. And of course, that's funds, a nice way to say money. But I'm talking to the choir. You guys do a wonderful job. Um, we are blessed. Let's give God thanks for our blessing. Father, we are truly blessed by you, each and every one of us. We have homes, cars, jobs, uh, just more than we could even think of. And your blessings rain down upon us minute by minute, day by day. Thank you for those blessings. We pray, Father, as we give back today, that we give back in a manner with a cheerful heart and that you do great things with these funds. Again, we pray in his name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Next song, we number 634. 634. We'll work till Jesus comes. 634. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. And let's all sing. Oh, land of rest for thee, I 
side when will the moment come when I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home we'll work till Jesus comes we'll work Till Jesus comes, we'll work. Till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. I sought at once my Savior's side no more. My step. my heavenly home will work till Jesus comes will work till Jesus comes will work till Jesus comes and will be If you'd like to mark your books, you can do that at page 904. Page 904, that will be our invitation song. A song before the Brother Jace brings us our lesson this morning. In 587, sing and be happy. 587, we'll sing verses 1 and 3. If you'd like, you may stand as we sing. <clears throat> Let's all sing. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. seem great all the whole day through. There's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend. Trust in His promises grand. Sing and be happy. Press we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust Him each day, we shall have pleasure untold. Sing and be happy. Press on to the gold. Trust Him who leads you There was a single day in my childhood that I 
every, it came about every year. And I look forward to it more than all the rest. And it was always in the summer. Uh, we would go camping. Me and several of my friends, my father and some of his friends would go down. We had a friend who owned a cabin in the woods down in the valley, and we would go down there. And I don't know what made it, I don't know, I guess because just going outdoors, something about being a kid and going outdoors kind of got you fired up. But we would get there on a Friday afternoon, and we would play wiffle ball all afternoon, throw football. We would, when it got dark, we would play hide-and-go-seek. And I remember one, one instance in particular, I stayed hidden for so long. I, I was squatted down in the woods for so long that I'm going to have to stand up here to give you a visual. I had chickens from here to here, all the way around. Now that's a story for another day. But when it got real dark, we would play hide and seek, and that's what happened to me. But I remember every night, we would always have a fire. And on, on a cool, brisk night, we would uh, be sitting around the fire, roasting some marshmallows, and that fire was was just perfect at just the right distance. But it, being kids, we always got too close. The reality of life is that it gets hot by the fire. Life throws an awful lot of fire at us. Trials, tribulations, opportunities, instances in which we have to come to a crossroads, to make a decision. Do what God has called me to do, or do what Jace wants Jace to do. Do what's right, or do what everyone else does and do what's easy. There's three instances in Scripture that I, I want to look at today. Two in the Old Testament, one in the New. I'd invite you to go to Genesis chapter 22. We see the first instance in Genesis chapter 22 of an individual who gets by the fire. And it's a life-altering experience. Father Abraham really needs no introduction. He is the father of the Hebrew people. God comes to him in Genesis chapter 12 and tells him that in him all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. He's talking about Christ, of course, would eventually come from the seed of Abraham and uh, give everyone the opportunity to be in the family of God. Abraham needs no introduction. We grow up in vacation Bible school singing Father Abraham had many sons. It's a universal fact. Everyone pretty much knows who Abraham is. But one thing Abraham did not have, and God gave him a promise that kind of had Abraham scratching his head, was the fact that in him would become a great nation. At the age of 75, God promises Abraham that he's going to have a son. And for some 25 years, Abraham has no son. Sarah, his wife, is, is barren. And for whatever reason, Abraham and Sarah get this idea that, well, if God has made this promise, I, he's obviously forgotten about us. We'll just take it into our own hands. Here's my handmaiden, Hagar, have a son through her. The reality of this is, and this is just a sidebar, when God makes a promise, he always keeps it. It may not be in our time, but he always keeps it every time. Abraham finally gets that baby boy in chapter 21. And don't you know, he's the apple of his eye. Little Isaac running around, he gets to see him grow up. And the reality of life hits Abraham hard one day. The giver of life, the individual who promised him a son, comes to him in chapter 21 and says, excuse me, chapter 22 and says, Go, take your son, your only son, Isaac whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and all from there on the mountain to which I shall tell you. What do you do with that, Abraham? What, what, what do you do with the idea that the God who promised you a son is now coming to you and saying, go offer your son as a sacrifice? 25 years you waited, you finally get him, he grows up, you get to see him become a young lad, and... You love this boy more than anything in the world. Notice how it describes him. Your son, possessive. Your only son, exclusive. Isaac, personal, whom you love. There's an emotional attachment there. What do you do, Abraham? I love verse 3. So Abraham rose early. No delay. God says, do this, Abraham does it. 
What's the reaction time when God tells us to do something? Do we sit there and ponder it? Do we, do we count the cost? Are we sitting there scratching our heads? Now, what's going to happen if I do this? What happens if I do that? Do I do it right now? Do I do a bit later? Is it my time to do it? If God says do something, the simple reaction is to do it. My question is, how well do you think Abraham slept that night? He rose early. And because of the, the story so brief, and Scripture gives us so much detail on so many things, but there's a lot of stuff that's left out simply because of space, right? It says, so Abraham rose early in the morning, and he saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering. That, that's just so black and white to me. But don't you know Abraham has to be just beside himself? Can, can you see a man distraught, tears rolling down his eyes as he saddles his donkey? A man sitting there splitting the wood that he knows is going to be used to kill his son and tears are just strolling down his face. But then notice this. Verse 5, And Abraham said to his young man, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. Notice where he puts it. He lays it on Isaac. You ever thought about where else in history you've seen someone else carry their own wood to their own execution? So many similarities between Isaac and Jesus. I never really noticed it until this, this study. He laid it on Isaac, his son. And here's where we get to the crossroads. He took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. We, we know how the story ends. He's got the blade drawn. He's got the fire cooking. His young son, Father, where's, where's the offering? We have the wood. We have everything we need. Where's the offering? What does he say? God will provide. And doesn't he always? Hand drawn. Abraham, Abraham. The angel of the Lord calls out to him, do not kill the boy. Crossroads of life. The fire got hot there for Abraham. And you know what he was willing to do? Exactly what God asked him to do. At his own personal cost. To lose his own son. But he was willing to do it. That's a pretty good example of someone who rose to the occasion. Someone who embraced the fire and answered the correct way. Person number two. Flip over with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Another instance is Moses. Verse three of chapter, uh, verse one of chapter three. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, "I will now turn aside and see this great sight." why the bush does not burn. I love, for whatever reason, I just want to imagine that Moses is just going through a normal work day here. This isn't just another day at the office, just out tending his father-in-law's sheep. And just ordinary. Just, just life's ordinary. And then extraordinary happens. He turns and he looks and he sees a bush that is on fire. Now the angel of the Lord manifests himself many different times throughout Scripture in different ways. Typically it's in a bodily manifestation. But for whatever reason, in this instance, it's in the form of fire. And Moses turns and he looks and for good reason says, Look at this great sight. And then he hears a voice, Moses, Moses, I am the God. God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I've heard the affliction of my people. I've heard them crying out. I have come down to deliver them, verse 8, out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I also have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. I'm going to deliver them, and here's how I'm going to do it. Verse 10, Come now, therefore, and I will send... You 
to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I want you to imagine the thoughts racing through Moses' mind. Moses fled Egypt at one point. Remember, he had killed that individual. Word had gotten back to Pharaoh, and he runs for his life. So Moses is hearing from God, the God who they really haven't heard from in over 400 years since they've been in captivity in Egypt. And he makes himself known. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Do you think Moses knew who those people were? Absolutely. Creating some common ground there. He says, go. And Moses starts doing what? Excuse after excuse after excuse. I, I'm a fugitive. I, I'm on the run. I'm going to have to go back to a family that I, that I deserted. And then here's excuse number one. But Moses said to him, verse 11, who am I? I I'm a nobody. I'm not anybody. Why, why, do you, why are you picking me? Send somebody else. Excuse number two. He says, who are you? Who should I say sent? And God answers, you tell them the I am sent you. Chapter 4 and verse 1. But suppose they will not believe that you came and told me to come. What should I do? Verse number 10. Then he says, oh Lord, I am not an eloquent speaker. That was his last ace in the hole. The problem with Moses is that he was so focused on what he couldn't do that he refused to see what God was going to enable him to do. The problem with Christians today is we make excuse after excuse after excuse. I can't do this. I'm too old to do this. I'm too young to do this. I, I can't... I can't get up and speak. I can't lead singing. I can't teach Bible class. I can't talk to somebody at work about Christ. I can't talk to somebody about Christ at the grocery store. I can't live. That's the problem. We sound like the man with too many barns. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. You see, because we wear the name of Christ, we have subjected ourselves to the call of Christ question is, are we answering? Because He has every right to put our feet to the fire. And all our answer should be is to embrace the fire. And the reality is this, if we can't handle that, if we can't handle what God is asking us to do, He's never asked us to do anything that He Himself was not willing to do when He was here in flesh. But if He keeps asking and we keep refusing, why do we continue to wear the name of Christ? If the heat is too hot, folks, get out of the kitchen. Stop faking it. Christ sees through fake. He doesn't appreciate fake because He was as real as it gets. He was as real as it gets. We need to be like the old prophet. When God calls, here I am, send me. Moses, a little hesitant first, but eventually he, he answers the call. Fire, both, in, both instances, monumental turning points for these individuals. Monumental. Both of them eventually answer in the correct fashion. But I want to look at one more, and that's where we'll spend the majority of our time this morning, of an individual in Scripture who was extremely close to Jesus. Luke chapter 22. If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 22. We're going to look at one other man. And just for the sake of introduction very quickly, there's two schools of thought when it comes to Jesus. And what I want to focus on for the next few minutes is the humanity of Jesus. There's two schools of thought. The scholarly community, the people that... There's a lot of atheists that study the Bible at a great depth and know their Bibles very well. And the theological community, there's, there's this image of Christ. History records that there was a Jesus of Nazareth. Secular history. And they have no issue saying that there was a man named Jesus who walked around Galilee, who taught and gathered disciples, and was eventually killed by Pontius Pilate. History records that outside of the Bible. They, they don't have a problem admitting that. Where they have a hang-up is when He claims to be God. Now, on the flip side of that, for the average churchgoer, for the average pew-sitter, we understand that the fact that Jesus is God is the foundation of Christianity. 
who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, say some of the prophets. Who do you say? Peter says what? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's foundational. Acts chapter 8 and verse 37, the Ethiopian unit makes the confession, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But where we have a little bit of hang up is understanding how God could fully become man and be just like us. That's hard for us to fathom. So what I want to think about here for just a minute is John chapter 1. We're going to be in Luke 22 in just a second, but John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. He has always been. And the Word was with God. He had the luxury of being with God, and He was God. So He's always been. He's always been with God. Oh, and He is God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 2. Verse 3 says, and excuse me, verse 3 says, All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Anything that is in existence owes its origin to who? Christ, the Word, the pre-incarnated Jesus. That's where our identity is found in Christ. Okay? Now, you skip down to verse 14 of John chapter 1. It says, And the Word, capital Word, talking about Jesus, became flesh. And He dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of that of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And we see flesh, and what do we automatically think? Skin and bones. But Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 12 through 15 talks about our high priest. And it says that we don't have a high priest who cannot empathize with us. There's a difference in sympathy and empathy. Sympathy is feeling sorry for someone outside of the circumstance. I, I don't know what it is to lose a parent. I have both of mine. So for me to say to someone, I know what you're going through if they lose a parent, well, that's untrue. Why? Because I've never felt it. Empathy, however, is having been in the shoes of that person and saying, I know what it's like to lose a parent because I myself have lost one. There's a difference. Christ can empathize with us. Why? Because He came in the flesh. He suffered. How did He suffer? Just on the cross? We talked about that in Bible class. Oh, no, no, no. He suffered the reality of being in relationship with man. We said that man was very good at one thing, and it's at letting each other down. Relationships. We struggle. Heartbreak. We hurt each other. We say mean things. He suffered locationally. He gave up the one place that we want to go in order to come to earth. He suffered immortality. He was forever and always going to be in the presence of God as He Himself was God without death. What did He do? He took on flesh so that He could die. He suffered immorality. Heaven, pure, blissful, righteous, no sin. Where did He come? The only place in the universe in which sin exists. He suffered emotionally. John chapter 11, his dear friend Lazarus passes. He weeps. Was he ever hungry? You betcha. Matthew chapter 4, 40 days in the desert. Was he ever thirsty? I thirst on the cross. He was like us. He cried. He laughed. He was happy. He was sad. He was in anguish. And we see in Luke chapter 22 a Jesus who is at the end of His human rope, if you will. If you will, turn with me there. Luke chapter 22. He's at the end of the rope. Why is He at the end of the rope? Because Christ has always existed. He has always been. He has always been in reality. And forever and always, that single event... That the humanity, excuse me, the single event that humanity revolves around is the cross. And it has always been in the distance. It has always been way down the road for Jesus. But when you get to Luke chapter 22, when is it? It's tomorrow. And we see a Jesus who is in anguish. It's always been coming, and it's finally here. Always been a shadow. And we see a Jesus who is struggling. And we see that in the things that He says, the things that He's thinking, His demeanor. We see it in His actions. Thinking about what He would like to do, but embracing what He has to do. 
And that ever so thin line is the difference between you and I being saved and you and I spending eternity in hell. Look at verses 31 and 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that, you may, that he may sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Peter says, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus reveals what is and what is to come when it comes to Peter. Addressing his best friend and telling him that Satan wants him and he wants him bad. And Peter, what does he do? He just kind of brushes it off. Doesn't really pay much attention to it. Now hindsight's twenty twenty for us, right? We can look at the whole story. Peter's living in the moment. Peter hears this from his best friend for the last three and a half years, his Lord and his Master, and he says, Peter, you're going to say you don't even know who I am. Verse 34. You're going to say you, you don't have a clue who I am. Not once, not twice, but three times. It kind of breaks Peter's heart a little bit. What do you, what do you mean I'm going to say that? Peter has no clue. Because I believe in this moment, Peter believes with all his, all his heart that his faithfulness is going to win out. I don't think him saying this, I'm willing to go to prison and death, is anything less than Peter having confidence in his self. And here's why. Because I have said the same things. And I have meant them with all of my heart. Promises and commitments I've made and I've stated with all of my being completely and totally convinced that they were true. But unfortunately, life is not lived in the upper room setting. Life is not lived in beautiful buildings like this. Life is not lived at church camp or places like Polishing the Pulpit or Exposure Youth Camp or the Challenge Youth Conference. Life is not lived with us constantly being bombarded with Christian love and affection. Christ, excuse me, the Christian life is lived out on the streets where our adversary walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he, and you can say this, may sift his wheat and devour and eternally damn. A Christian's life is not lived in a vacuum that has a moral thermostat. So when we go back into the world, those commitments, those vows, those I'm willing to give it all up for you, Jesus, I'm done with that sin, I'm giving it to you, those vows, those commitments, those promises, those statements still have to stand up just as true in the world as when we make them on the front pew in the church building. And that's up to us question is, are we going to hold it up? So this puts Christ in a little bit of dilemma. This claim by Peter, heartfelt and sincere though it was, it was not what? True. It was not true. So is Christ going to say what He wants to say or what He has to say? Because Christ is at the end of His rope, and we're going to see that down in verses 30, uh, 42 through 44. He's at the end of his rope. He's in a state of despair. Boy, it would be refreshing for Peter to really stand by Jesus' side. Whoo! Peter, thank you. Boy, I needed to hear that. You're going to stand by my side. You're willing to go to prison? That's fantastic. Man, I'm glad to hear that. I need that. I need your encouragement because this is tough. What I'm about to do is the hardest thing anyone has ever done. That's not what he said. And said he said what he had to say. And don't you know it had to break Jesus' heart to tell that to his best friend. You're going to say you don't know who I am. You're going to deny me three times. This is what I would like to call time period number one. Jesus at his weakest. Peter at his strongest. And Satan's licking his lips. Time period number two, they get into Gethsemane, verse 39. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, and as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter in temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed. It's interesting to me just how desperate for company is Jesus to take Peter in there with him. After what he just said, Peter, you're going to say you don't know who I am. And then says, come on in here with the garden with me. How desperate is Jesus for contact, for skin, 
just right there next to him. There's something about a hug, something about an embrace, the lifting of the spirits, and Jesus needs somebody beside him. Why? Because he's God sitting on a pedestal? No, because he was one of us. Because he's in a state of despair. Because he needs help. He needs support. He was about to do the hardest thing anyone has ever done. And the best friend he ever had was going to deny him, Peter, I want you by my side, but you're going to claim not to know me. So here, we get between two statements. Simon, Simon, Peter had, uh, Satan has asked you that you may, he may sift you as wheat. And we get down to this little verse right here. Verse 42, Father, if it is your will... Take this cup away from me. If there's any other way, if we can save humanity in any other fashion, take this cup of death and move it out of my sight. I'm willing, but I don't want to. And then look at this word. I don't know what your text says, but this is what mine says. Nevertheless, yours and mind salvation hangs on that word. The fact that he didn't want to go to the cross, his desire was to find another way. Nevertheless, what was he willing to do? The Father's will. And that ever so thin line is the difference between me being damned for all eternity and me having the opportunity to be saved. Christ, in his deity, knows the truth of Peter. But demonstrating his humanity, he asked God to remove that cup from him. That's time period number two. Time period number three, verse number 47. I'm sorry, verse 54. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. Notice this sentence. But Peter followed at a distance. It's interesting how detailed the Bible is. Not Peter followed, gives us the location. He followed how? At a distance. And who's he with? He's with everyone who just came and arrested Jesus. And here's where we get to the crossroads for Peter. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, where does Peter sit? Right in the middle of them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man also was with them. The ESV says, They sat down, they kindled a fire, Peter sat among them, and then the next word is then. That's how quickly being by the fire, being in the trials of life, demands an answer. He sat where he wasn't supposed to sit. He was in the midst of the situation he shouldn't have been in. Then. This man was also with him. And what does he say? Woman, I do not know him. The same mouth that said, I'm willing to go to prison. I'm willing to go to death. The same eyes that saw Jesus walking on the water, that saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, that saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the tomb. The same man that saw miracle after miracle, teaching after teaching. The same man who had walked with Jesus, had cried with Jesus, had suffered with Jesus, had abandoned everything for Jesus, says, I do not know the man. And my question to us is this, are we above that kind of scrutiny? If Peter can deny him, what does that say about the rest of us? It would be easy if life was lived in the upper room, would it not? With Jesus right there, preaching and teaching and us breaking bread together, life would be good. But it would not be life. Because life is lived by the fire. How many times have you made those commitments? Those heat of the moment, those rash vows, I'm ready to give it all up. I'm ready to turn it over to you. I'm done committing that sin only for you to fall right back into the grip of the world. I know those moments. Guess what? I've said those things. I've made those commitments. I've sat on the front pew. I've sat in my bedroom. I've been down on my knees and I've made those claims. And I've begged for the forgiveness of God only for a short time to pass 
and be right back in the same sin. And maybe, just maybe, not vocally with my words, but in my actions, in the things I thought, I said this. I don't know Him. And am I the only one? Denial number two and number three follow very shortly after that. Verse 59, then after about an hour had passed, if you look at the parallel accounts, one of them describes Peter as having swearing. He's just got to a boiling point. They just keep bombarding him with questions. Weren't you with him? Don't, aren't you a Galilean? Don't you know Jesus? And he cracks. Pressure does that. Surely this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Time was up. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. I, I don't know how far apart they are. I, I don't know if they're this close, if they're 20, 30, 40 yards. I, I don't know. But all I know is they make eye contact. They look at one another. And what is it like for Peter to deny him not once, not twice, but three times, just as Jesus said, for his Lord and Master to make that prophecy just a few short hours earlier and then it become a reality and you have to live with the fact that you've let him down that quick. What's that look like? Is it a look of scold by Jesus? Is it a look of I told you so? Is it a look of anger? I imagine if we're talking about Jesus, it was the same look He gives most of us. It's going to be okay. It's interesting. If you look at the parallel account in John chapter 13, the very last verse of chapter 13 says, Peter, you're going to deny knowing who I am. And then we somehow, in our English translations, we have separated them by chapters. And we don't look at them in context. You know what the first sentence is of chapter 14 and verse 1? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He let him down. His Lord, his Master. And this was his reaction, verse number 62. So Peter went out and he wept bitterly. How evil does Sodom and Gomorrah have to be to be called desperately wicked? To have that, when is wicked not bad enough? Desperately wicked. How bad do you have to be crying for it not to say just cry, not to say just wept? That's totally different. But he wept with this adverb, bitterly. What does it look like? It's anguish. It's distraught. It's a breaking down of the body. It's remorse. It's a mourning. He wept bitterly. I would rather weep bitterly in this life, having realized the sin and affront that I have brought before God, than to stand before my Maker and had never shed a tear. Because at that point, the only weeping that there will be will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth and the, and the lake that, fire, that burns with fire and brimstone. And I want no part of that. None whatsoever. How are you handling your fire today? Are you making those vows like Peter? I'm ready to give it all up. Only to go out and backtrack on your word. Are you all in? You're straddling the fence? What does your Christian life look like? I love this statement. Someone once said, if I asked Jesus what does his spiritual life look like, what would he say? It is. There's no separation. Spiritual life is life. It's embedded in everything that we do. What's your spiritual life like? I hope it is. I hope it's on fire and not being burned. I'm going to sing a song of encouragement here in just a second. If you've never submitted to Christ, become a Christian, and enjoy the, the luxuries of being in Him, it's the only place in the world 
in the physical realm and the spiritual realm in which spiritual blessings are afforded to us. We talked about those in Bible class, the spiritual blessings that are found in Ephesians chapter 1. I am adopted into His family if I am in Christ. I have an identity in Christ. Number two, I have redemption. My sins, they are no more. They are blotted out, wholly smeared out, not covered, but obliterated. And I have an inheritance waiting for me upon the arrival of Christ, or death calls me. I hope you enjoy those luxuries. I hope you are in Christ. But if you're not, I hope you'll make that decision today. If there be anything that we can help you with, I hope you'll come as we stand and as we sing. Have you been to evening at six o'clock brother andrew will be speaking for us this evening so make your plans to be here for that uh we do have those again that, that are on our sick list and I, I failed to mention uh susie kirby this morning she tested positive for covid so please if you would uh, remember her in your prayers you might have seen that on the remind app uh, we sent that out yesterday i think she actually tested positive yesterday morning and i might have put the day before but uh either way she's going to be in quarantine for a little bit so if you would remember her in your prayers Obviously, that's close to her heart, as you can imagine. Uh, are there others that we may not know about that we need to be aware of? Thank you so much for being here. Let us know when you're going to be back in town, all right? <laughs> Our closing song, 957. 957. And we'll sing that after, we'll sing one verse of that, and after that, we'll be dismissed in prayer. Thank you so much for being here. Let's sing. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. 